I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar. Um, and today we're going to be looking at, looking at uh, marketing in 2020 and how, how to make the most of this new norm, I guess, in this COVID environment that we still find ourselves living in. Today we're joined by Mick Donoghue, who's the owner of Capstone Marketing. Um, Mick's had 25 years in the, the marketing industry, working with clients mainly in the Illawarra area and sort of focusing on both business to business uh, marketing as well as business to consumer marketing. So I'd like to welcome Mick along today. Thanks for, thanks for joining us, Mick. Morning, everyone. Uh, and we've also got Gary Pinch here, Director of Accounting Professionals. Um, who's also joining us this morning. So hello, Gary. Hi, Brad. Um, so as I mentioned today, we're going to have um, a look at marketing and probably take the time first up to look at the effect that COVID-19 has had on, on, on marketing and businesses um, from a sales point of view. Um, and then we'll sort of work forward and look at what the um, community, c consumer sentiment is um, out there and then flowing on from that where the opportunities might lie for your business and then working out how we can formulate a plan moving forward so that's the the um, the plan for today and we'll get stuck into it because there's um, quite a bit of content today um, and I'm sure you'll find it all very interesting so I guess firstly um, to start off with Mick um, I guess, what are you seeing out there um, or what are you seeing the impact that COVID's had out there, probably more so in the, the economy in general? Yeah, thanks, Mark. Uh, look, you know, no doubt, uh, you know, it's had a devastating effect uh, across the board, um, you know, for economies worldwide. But you know, I think uh, what we have seen is some of the best performing businesses have, have been able to um, rise to the challenge, I suppose you'd say, and, um, you know, keep... Uh, customers and prospects, pros, prospects, sorry, interested in a, in, a, in a tough time for everyone. Um, how have they done that? Well, they, they sort of worked out a way to, to meet their audience of buyers online. So um, what I've you know, found, you know, COVID has really been a, a change accelerator, if you like, um, you know, really sort of brought the online world to the fore for many. Yeah, and I guess um, particularly early on when, I guess, looking at sort of Australia and, and probably New South Wales as a case, um, as you mentioned, that change was accelerated really early on in the piece when everyone was in in lockdown. And mm. sort of when we look at you know the buyers, how how buyers react? How did buyers mm. react to that initially? I guess. Yeah, well, I, I guess uh, you know what we saw there really was that um, across the board, all the indicators were up in terms of website traffic increased, email volume. Um, increased uh, as did uh, the open rates of, of email which typically you know uh, they don't go hand in hand you know sometimes it gets a bit of um, email fatigue if you're getting bombarded but what we did see was that um, you know, both email volume and open rates increased because people had more time you know working from home at home less distractions and, and spent more time online and also um, you know as a result of all that online sales increased also. I guess just a quick question for you, Gary, um, you know, in your experience working um, with our clients, um, do you think many clients are looking at, at I guess, the email and, and more particularly the open rate um, when, they're, when they're undertaking their marketing activities? Yeah, certainly, Mark. I, look, I see that uh, there's definitely a lot more email traffic to see the emails that we receive and probably sort of different industry sources. Um, and certainly emails become an effective way to, to connect to the marketplace, um, similar like a lot of other um, you know, online mediums. I wouldn't say necessarily see email um, being the only medium that you would use, but certainly it's been an effective medium. I think the, the, the thing, I suspect this will evolve over time, but it's actually probably important uh, about how you might use email, um, particularly um, if you use emails as the primary means of communication with your customers, if you then combine and use the email as the primary means of marketing, you might find that um, your effectiveness of communicating with, with customers and clients through email could get disturbed because of the amount of email traffic. 
So I think it's important that uh, uh, how you use email as a means of communication. And that could well come down to whether you have different email addresses for different purposes, which, which could become an important aspect about how email is being used in the future. Um, so I think what will happen out of COVID, like lots of things, um, is the way that we do things online will continue to evolve uh, based on how we see how effective we see the strategy. Yeah. And just, so just and just um, folks staying on the email side of things for a second. Are there any tools out there, Mick, that clients can sort of use to um, you know, get some understanding of how many people are actually opening their emails? Uh, you mentioned the, the open rate there. Yeah, look, there's lots of there's lots of tools around now. A lot of people are familiar with products like uh, Mail Mailchimp, for example, or Campaign Monitor. Um, then you can sort of move up into more uh, CRM type software uh, like HubSpot, for example, um, and then sort of best of the breed, if you like, is Salesforce. So, there's a right, you know, depending on you know the level of your um, business and complexity and size of database, there's a whole range of um, products out there that are worth exploring. Yeah. So we've sort of, um, you know, you've mentioned that, that website traffic's increased, email, and, and then as a result, um, online sales. We've probably got some some graphs here that that really highlight it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Exactly right. Um, you know, no surprise. Uh, you know, with people more, people spending more time at home and online, that um, uh, you know online sales growth you know, up 95% year on year. Um, you can see there on that slide there that, you know, far outweighed the, uh, the growth in retail sales, making a bit of a comeback there towards the end of July. Um, but I think, you know, the, the next slide is, is quite telling also where we look at um, sales uh, for the month of August year on year are also up 85%, but, but 10% up on, uh, the Christmas period of, of uh, you know, December 19. So, um, you know, that, that's a, you know, a telling sign that um, people have, have gone online in droves. And if you look at the distribution by state, again, no surprise, Victoria is leading the way there, spent the, the, the most time in lockdown across Australia and the top five online shopping destinations by volume are all in Victoria as well. So uh, a sign of the times there, I'm, I'm sure they're all, Pretty happy to be getting out and about the next 24 hours. Yeah, just, and just one of the questions on some of those numbers when you go online, was it um, the breakdown between face-to-face uh, -face sales and online sales is still like 90% face-to-face and 10% online, but uh, for what I gauge now, that's something going like 80% face-to-face and 20% online. Mm -hmm. And I suppose that drop down more recently has probably meant that um, face to face sales have gone up to 85% in the more recent months as states start to open up. And then, mm. but online sales are still maintained 15%. That's probably, and it, when I saw those numbers, I always took the view that the online sales were substantially higher than that, but they're still making, you know, they're making sort of um, inroads into face to face sales. Uh, but it probably does highlight um, uh, the challenge that. Uh, because COVID has created that environment, which is the ideal for online sales, uh, but it also probably creates the challenge that, um, you know, online sales will take a long time to overtake face-to-face -face sales. Mm. And I think one thing that COVID's probably even indicated in this environment is that um, um, people um, have always indicated they enjoy the face-to-face -face sales in view of, you know, the opportunity to mix with community. Uh, mm. And that's probably been reinforced, particularly out of the Victorian experience. So I think that a lot of those things are uh, interesting ref to reflect on and um, um, important to read into some of the numbers too, that, that um, online sales will continue to grow mm -hmm. inevitably uh, because they, they provide all the convenience that online shopping does, um, et cetera. But um, how um, there will always be that element of the face-to-face -face. and that goes to the retail solution of the best outcomes often created where uh, and Avenue's got the ability to provide both online sales and face-to-face -face sales. Um, but it was interesting in a reflection on some of those numbers, yeah. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. And I think, uh, you know, it's a bit like um, uh, it, it, marketing. As some people always sort of ask, you know, should I be doing traditional or digital? Well, it's really not a competition. I think it's whatever, you know, works best for your business. And it's the same with the, um, 
you know, retail versus online. Mm. Just on those, the, the top performing channels of, of 2019, so I guess this is pre-COVID uh, yeah. data. Uh, it'd be interesting to see how these, these numbers change, but that certainly uh, there's a few standouts there. Mm, yeah, definitely. You know, um, organic search, people are starting to work out a way to provide good, helpful content um, so organic search, paid search, email marketing, um, content marketing, uh, the best performing channels of last year. Uh, what, what we're starting to see now as a result of, of um, uh, COVID is that, you know, we're reducing spend um, across the board in marketing, but obviously, you know, it's concentrating more on those low cost, high return on investment channels. So, uh, people are lowering their budgets, but spending more on on things like search engine optimization um, and and some of those less costly channels. So paid media, for example, you know has has dropped uh, from the evidence that we're seeing, uh, and uh, people are uh, you know reacting to uh, the times as well. What we're seeing is people shopping with purpose. So uh, you know, as you mentioned, you know, buy trying to buy local. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, so that's where some of that good um, uh, SEO comes into play where, you know, I'm looking for, uh, you know, a flower shop near me, for example. You know, you want to be able to appear on that on that first page when people are searching um, for your products and services. So that's really, um, you know, what we're seeing there with that. People are, you know, lo- looking to um, uh, find efficiencies in their marketing spend. Um Focusing on brand experience, so you know, uh, trying to uh, get the message out there about service and trust, particularly around health and hygiene, uh, which is uh, no surprise. But just getting back to the basics of, of service um, and trust, really. Yeah, and I guess the probably the thing that we see most often is is when things get tight within businesses, the the marketing budget's often the first thing to go, mm. um, and um, there's probably some. This slide here, which talks about um, you know reducing spend and what what businesses' reactions are to their marketing activities, particularly in a time of you know where things financially are a little bit tight. Yeah, look, I think you know fr- from uh, our experience, uh, you know people are often aware of the four P's of marketing, um, you know, and mostly promotion. You know, how can I tell people about my business? What what we're seeing pleasingly is that people are spending more time on strategy or the other P's, you know, price, um, you know, uh, place, which is you know, distribution, um, those sorts of uh, strategic decisions. So looking at, you know, uh, positioning and, and um, you know, who, who really are my customers, where are they and how, how can I reach them? So it's, you know, getting back to, to strategy, not just to focus on, you know, on the promotion and I guess Gary, that that, that you know, the top item on that on that slide, you know, fifty eight percent of of businesses' response is to lower the marketing marketing budget, um, and that's always fraught with danger. Yeah, look, I, and certainly their experience has been, um, and I think people will need to reflect in their contemplating a reduction of the budget. Um, uh, some of the statistics in regard to the impact COVID has had on business, because our experience has probably been the opposite. The businesses are actually spending more money on marketing or a little being probably more strategic, maybe spend the same amount of money, but more strategic to place. They're actually having outstanding outcomes that their business are actually growing. And I think that's consistent. When we look at drilling down to where those, that growth's coming from, it, it's growth that's associated with the disruption caused by COVID. Um, you know, it's like if you're in sort of that home improvements marketplace, um, the perception might be, well, just marketing because no one can afford to do home improvements. Well, COVID actually created the opposite result in some respects, particularly in regard to small home improvements. More people stuck at home, more people saw what was happening around them at home and wanted to do more and then had to resort to online um, to look at what the alternatives were to do home improvement work. So in some respects, uh, in making the assessment to lower the budget, it really needs to be done in context of understanding your particular marketplace. Certainly if your marketplace is closed down, there's not a lot of sense in doing advertising and marketing or spending a lot of money on uh, the traditional marketing because um, you might not be able to deliver or sell products to that marketplace. But 
Um, so a clear understanding, and this comes back to the point that Mick had raised, a clear understanding of strategy based around understanding your marketplace is actually quite critical. Because as I said, our, you know, um, from the point of view of the analysis of our clients' results, the people who are achieving the best outcomes are those that have actually uh, either increased their marketing budget or repositioned it to be more strategic based upon what they understand about their customers. Yeah. Um, and um, Gary, I think you mentioned earlier about how the, the business, the sales model is changing. This next graph looks at um, primarily business to business mm. um, sales model and how that's changed pre and post COVID. Yeah, I think, um, you know, what we've seen with a number of clients um, is they're understanding first around their marketplace, um, understanding um, uh, what part of their, what segment of their marketplace is growing, that segment's not growing, and they're just repositioning their, their strategy around those things. And you know, the, one of the clear examples is probably that sort of um, cafe bar industry where, you know, they saw identified that, um, the face-to-face the -face part of their marketplace was going to decline because of lockdowns, but the takeaway online sales part of the marketplace improved. So, um, and the interesting thing there is to reflect on, you know, having a, a stronger online version of that marketplace by having online um, ordering and then takeaways or home delivery was quite crude because they were identifying a separate um, sales model to fit that. And then now what we're seeing people coming, you know, in that industry coming out of COVID, they now have two different revenue models being the face-to-face -face model, which has now returned, but they now have a takeaway online um, and face and, and delivery model, which basically has just meant their sales channels have doubled. Um, and, but the interesting part about that is how they've evolved in that marketplace to incorporate that, um, that strategy into their online or their social media marketing. Uh, because they've now identified a marketplace that wants to connect with them online. Um, and that's sort of had an enhanced means of um, firstly um, uh, selling new, new channels or new business opportunities, but also just um, bringing new, new um, customers to the marketplace. Um, I guess, Mick, the, the, um, I guess the, the part of the graph that stands out for me in this one is the, the in-person versus the field sales mm -hmm. team. Um, you know, that's quite a significant drop there pre and post COVID. Yeah, look, it just sort of reflects, you know, what's happening in the B2C side of things too. Businesses are investing more in the online e-commerce um, side of things. Um, it, it's, it's not to say there's still not a role for the you know for the face to face. It'll it'll come back, um, but it's it's more happening. You know, people are interacting with customers on the phone and virtually now, as opposed to you know getting out in the field, um, uh, which has been a you know a, a result of the the social distancing and and health and safety uh, rules that have been in place for for COVID nineteen. Um, yeah, I guess that's probably a, a space we'll watch with interest to see what happens over the next six to 12 months. Yeah, it is going to be really interesting because I think, you know, part of the, the concept of going to, um, you know, selling online or, or virtually um, is for, for businesses, there's a significant reduction in their operating costs, in particularly for mm. travelling costs for those, those sales members that might be out and about traveling with to, to see customers so um yeah it'll be interesting to see what that balance is between mm. between face to face um and and the sales that that sort of method generates mm. compared to the cost savings of um interacting with your clients virtually yeah i mean we're even seeing just in, in the trades you know people you know wanting a quote um you know so it's all happening digitally you know not physically turning up and uh, and having a look at um you know a backyard for example or a or a um you know a, a, a in, internal renovation for a, a particular area um it, it has been uh, done online with sharing of photos and measurements with a final inspection obviously <laughs> for, for, for the work in some cases but um it's basically you know turn you know uh, created that opportunity for business to save a lot of time in the day, not traveling around uh, doing quotes. Mm. 
So we might move on now, and, and this is some results from the Consumer Sentiment Survey in September. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess the first slide here is, um, I guess, the expected growth in, in different industries in relation to online channels. Yeah, so you can see uh, you know, certainly you know, in, in typical areas like electronics and apparel, uh, you know, th they've always been sort of strong areas of online on sales, but there's certainly uh, still room for growth in some of those areas or people are expected to, um, to, to make more of their purchases online post-COVID in those areas. But, but um, you know, as Gary mentioned before, you know, food, food and takeout delivery, um, uh, footwear, uh, groceries, uh, really across the board, um, uh, you know, all sectors are experiencing uh, growth in online and, and expected to continue. Mm. Uh, interestingly, also, um, you know, many of us have actually tried different brands and retailers. So, um, and and as a result, intend to continue that. So you can see there, you know, 32% uh, tried a different brand, 15% um, tried a new shopping method. So whether that was, uh, you know, buying on their buying from their phone or laptop or um, some other mobile device, um, you know. So uh, I think. Uh, you know, the signs are encouraging for, for those businesses that have you know, invested in online, that, are, that is certainly, there's a strong intention there for that to continue. Um, and that's probably just a reflection of what I was talking about before, Mick, where I think this is a, you know, COVID's created the opportunity where the market is, you know, uniquely disrupted uh, in a way that it probably hasn't been done, hasn't been done for a long time. Um, and what those statistics probably highlight is the fairness for people to change. Um, yeah. So if you don't have a strong online presence uh, and if you haven't challenged yourself to expand your opportunities in the marketplace, that people will vote with their feet. Um, mm. And uh, that's why it's important that, you know, the best means of, um, uh, you know, challenges from a competitive point of view is to be part of the competition uh, by having a presence. Yeah. And I guess then that this flows on to the next chart, which some of these factors you mentioned earlier, Mick, about, you know, what people are mm. looking for when they're going online. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, obviously, you know, value, value is, is, is a key driver, um, availability of products, convenience, but, uh, and also um, that, that purpose-driven um, uh, decision-making that I talked about earlier. So, you know, looking at supporting local business, um, sustainability, the environment, they're all sort of strong indicators for people. Um, but uh, uh, obviously the health and hygiene side of things also appears in there. But uh, certainly, you know, you know, people value for money, supporting local businesses has been a key driver. Yeah, and I think that particularly early on, sort of in April, May and June, there was a strong sense of community and, and people looking to support um local businesses um so that that probably that 26 percent number there doesn't surprise me too much based on what we sort of seen what we've seen um you know out in the community particularly um in the initial stages of lockdown where people were looking to spend money at businesses that were sort of vulnerable i guess um the next one we've got here um, looks at um, sustainable products and socially responsible companies. Um, yeah, so again, just sort of reflecting that uh, decision making process and you know, it's, you know, drilling down as to why people are you know looking to uh, buy certain products, certain categories. It's um, again, um, you know, safety, uh, purpose, value. Um, you know, we saw in the US, you know, Black Lives Matters was a big theme over there. Uh, equally here, uh, and also you know the the the, uh, the climate change uh, movement as well, very strong. So those sorts of themes are continuing um, uh, through, throughout. And I think again, it's just just a as I mentioned in the at the start that you know, uh, change accelerator is is what COVID has turned out to be. Um, but interestingly, uh, you know, this is probably excludes those uh, people in Victoria that are. Um, about to uh, escape from their homes, but you know, 80% of Australians were indicating that they they were waiting for uh, you know signals other than the lifting of restrictions before re-engaging re in in out of home activities. So there was still a bit of um, 
uh, this is back in September, still a bit of a cautious um, uh, approach there. Um, so, you know, I, I think uh, that's starting to change now as restrictions, more restrictions are being lifted and we're all um, you know, looking forward to getting back out there and supporting our, our local business. I guess, um, and this is the one that, that probably interests mm. me the most, and this is how um, certainly um, since the start of COVID, a, a lot of our habits have changed. Um, and I guess the, the, the big question is, um, what things will we go back to doing and what things will we keep doing the new way, I guess? Yeah, yeah, that, that's it. Well, uh, uh, of course, we're all going to you know, keep up our uh, fitness regimes that we undertook during lockdown. Um, but yeah, certainly, uh, you know, telemedicine, you know, health uh, video conferencing, Zoom, you know, Zoom has become a, a you know, it's, it's almost like Google now, isn't it? You know, everyone's Zooming. So uh, th these are the sorts of activities that are expected to uh, continue um, as, as part of the norm moving forward. Um, and you know, for, for those people that are, can, can adapt to that and, uh, and offer that as a service or, or a way of communicating certainly will benefit. So, um, you know, online learning, uh, remote learning, those sort of areas are also expected to continue um, as people you know, just you know, become more comfortable with the use of technology in their everyday life. Uh, you know, outside of personal use, it's, it's really um, just become, become the norm. Yeah. And, um, you know, certainly some of these things that we, we might go away from. I, I know personally I was watching the eSports, particularly the, the motor racing, which was, <laughs> at times it was hard to tell whether it was um, real or virtual. Um, but obviously things like that now that the real things back on are so, sort of starting to fall behind yeah. the wayside there. Yeah, of course. Yeah. But I guess, look, in, in all of that, you know, there's always opportunities for business and, um, you know, if you look at the sorts of activity that business has undertaken over the last six months, you know, almost half of businesses have actually, um, you know, released updates or made improvements to their products or services. Half of those businesses have, have, have changed strategy or, you know, uh, had to change strategy and, and, and also uh, gathered feedback. So talking and listening to customers and uh, taking the time to, to find out, you know, what their problems are and, and, and how they can be solved, um, you know. So everyone sort of had that time to reflect, I guess, and, and, and pivot to a to a new way of working. So, um, you know, that's uh, been in, been encouraging. Um, so some of the ways that those businesses have pivoted, um, you know, cutting out the the non-essential stuff. Yeah. So you know. Again, a bit like when you know looking at uh, reducing budgets and, and looking to spend on on those areas that um, that are, that are known to generate revenue. So just focusing on on you know on the basics and, and what's known to work. Um, focusing on customer retention. So you know keeping keeping your existing customers um, uh, and. You know, and and then also moving those budgets from in-person processes to the digital or virtual world. They're the sorts of things that have happened in that, um, in that early phase of, of cutting uh, costs, I guess, uh, which, which resulted in you know, certain things had to, had to change, particularly with staff uh, being in, um, in stand-down positions in some sectors. Uh, the other thing that we saw is brand building. So, you know, people focusing on, on, on brand. So, not so much selling, you know, really about um, getting the brand out there through, you know, online tactics, social media, email marketing. Um, you know, we've seen a change to virtual events as opposed to uh, in-person events. Um, but really, you know, uh, trying to um, focus on that longer-term strategy rather than short-term sell. Yeah. Um, Do you think that there's been a shift either towards or away from bigger brands? Through the through the COVID period. Well, I think you know we saw in some of those earlier slides, consumers are prepared to um, to try new brands and, and different things. So, um, yeah, I, I think there's a, there has been you know, to what a, to what effect and how deep that goes longer term, um, time will tell. But yeah, certainly there's there's um, you know, a willingness to try alternatives. Mm. 
the the other area, I guess, um, well, there's a couple of areas, but certainly improving. You know, I mentioned before about focusing on customer retention. So that's been about um, you know trying to improve that experience for customers. So um, you know, so that you know general improvements to the online experience, um, th those sorts of activities that that uh, help solve customers' problems. Um, you know, it's certainly been an area of focus for businesses, um, you know, as moving events online, um, uh, those sorts of activities. And, and also empathy, you know, so really, uh, you know, that focus on on, um, on the longer term rather than the short term sales, ask customers how they're doing and, you know, how, how you can help um, identify their challenges and solutions that, uh, based on their industry or their um, or their, their problem uh, rather than, you know, sell, sell, sell. Yeah, I guess in, in relation to the improving the experience, um, I think mm -hmm. that's particularly important in a, um, certainly on, a, on an online basis where you might, you know, identify a product that you're interested to and then all of a sudden you have problem problems with your shopping cart and yep. all of that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. People are, it's very easy just to cancel and then go to the next Mm. Um, the next supplier um, rather than, you know, if you're, you're actually at the shop front, it's not as, and you, you know, something becomes a little bit more difficult than it needs to. Um, it's not a matter of necessarily just going next door and, and get making the purchase there. So um, that's certainly one of the things that I've found is that, you know, businesses whose, you know, their, their backend e-commerce system might not yeah. be um, as functional or as efficient than others are potentially going to lose out there. Mm. Yeah, just looking at streamlining some of those uh, clunky processes as well, you know, and, and where can you gain some of those efficiencies online, you know, taking some of those offline processes and um, uh, smoothing those out, but also, you know, a seamless online experience as well that just aids, aids the customer and, and, and aids the sale for sure. Yeah. So, you know, as part of those those four, I guess, four business pivots, we've seen a number of responses from uh, different industries um, over this period. Um, we might, might yeah, uh, get yeah. some insight into that. Yeah, look, we've touched on them, you know, certainly in you know, training and education areas, you've seen, you know, the online webinars and, and training, um, you know, buy one, gift one, uh, you know, sort of, sort of a, a discount for a second seat or a, or a, um, uh, you know, for, for uh, refer a friend, for example, uh, travel and weddings, um, you know, well, this is probably one of the key sectors that's really uh, done it tough. So, um, you know, they're really focusing on, oh, I guess, ramping up for the, uh, for, for the next, uh, you know, for the summer here in Australia, of course, but uh, 2021 and, and that you can see those holiday at home campaigns starting to roll out now. Uh, florists, gifts, uh, hampers, uh, that sort of whole sector, you know, focusing on the contact uh, free deliveries, um, you know, house plants with a lot of people working from home now and, uh, you know, their home has become their office, trying to brighten those things up, care packages, gift vouchers, these are the sorts of things that um, have come to the fore, supporting local businesses. Uh, so we're seeing, you know, cross promotions with like-minded businesses getting together in, in a region. Uh, you know, buy from the bush has become a, um, a a new push there, where they partner with PayPal, for example, to create an online marketplace. So you know, um, you know, a clothing store out in Dubbo now has a uh, a greater online presence than they, they may have otherwise, um, and, and being able to connect, uh, you know, uh, worldwide. In fact, so so th there's been a lot of. Uh, new ideas and initiatives come through cafes restaurants bars we've talked about those in terms of you know uh, the takeaway and home delivery um, special deals for essential frontline workers um, all sorts of different strategies coming to the fore and, and home improvements as well with virtual quotes and um, you know how-to videos and you know tutorials uh, for those you know uh, uh, home home projects that uh, Certainly, back in March and April, I know were um, uh, pretty, pretty heavily uh, you know, keep, keeping people sane. I suppose, uh, you know. So, so they're the sorts of things that we saw through um, uh, through the last six months. Uh, companies adapting. 
So we sort of, um, I guess, covered off on, you know, how COVID has, has changed the marketplace and, and where, where consumer sentiment's at um, and what some, where the opportunities might lie and what some industry specific, you know, responses have been. Um, how do we go about formulating a plan, I guess, for our own business to, to tie all of that, these opportunities together? Mm. Yeah, um, look, I think uh, uh, one of my sort of favourite quotes from almost 100 odd years ago now is uh, from uh, this US pioneer, uh, John Wanamaker, who said half the money I spend on advertising is wasted. The trouble is I don't know which half. And, uh, you know, some of the avid golfers in, in the room might know um, that, you know, uh, insert uh, golf into advertising and it's the same story. <laughs> But um, I, look, I think, uh, uh, you know, th these days it is much easier to work out what's working and what's not working. You know, we can really sort of hone in down to, down to the individual. If you have a look at some of the uh, ROI estimates from different channels these days, you know, TV, 60% return on investment, uh, print, 120% return on investment, email marketing, you know, $38 uh, return per dollar spent. So... Uh, you know, particularly in the digital world, it's much easier to um, be very accountable for the dollars that you spend. But regardless, uh, you know, uh, whether it's the digital world or the traditional world, the key, there's some key elements that you really need to focus on. Um, uh, you know, and it just gets back to basics, really. You know, who, who is your target audience? Um, you know, how are you different? You know, why should they buy from you? What are how are you different from the, the competition down the road? What makes you stand out? Um, how are you positioned? So really, um, you know, is it customer centric? Uh, is it on technology? Uh, you know, what's your position in the market compared to your competitors? And also, you know, messaging uh, become, has become very important these days, particularly around, uh, as I said, uh, you yeah, know, a bit more empathetic and understanding what your customers and buyers are going through at the moment rather than just trying to sell, sell, sell. So, you know, these are, these are key elements that, um, you know, uh, stand the test of time. Um, and, and, you know, by focusing on these areas in your strategy, uh, you know, out, coming out the other end is, is a better execution when you roll out your promotional messages. And I think that the key to success, and Gary can probably um, talk more about this, is actually having clear goals and documenting those goals, creating a plan and, and following it. Yeah, certainly, Mark. And one of the things that, uh, and just going back to the other slide, just you know, which probably leads on to just setting the goals, uh, I think what COVID has done is allow people to, to you know, get back to the basics about assessing their marketing strategy, but also... Um, assessing the context of those key elements, you know, the target market potentially has changed um, or um, has expanded or has evolved as a consequence of COVID and the lockdowns that occurred as part of that. Um, and that's typical what happens in a disrupted marketplace is you, you really need to get back to basics and do a rest assessment of those key elements going forward and then setting, uh, once you've got an understanding about um, your market, and I think, one of those things that's become more and more critical because of data availability is making really clever data-based decisions, um, decisions based around um, you know, understanding um, what your market looks like, uh, where the sales have traditionally come from, uh, where the opportunities are opening up, um, where the market's growing. A lot of that data is readily available now. Um, uh, and then make, once you make an assessment about what your strategy looks like, make sure it's clearly got, uh, aligned with what your overall sort of business goals are and look at the market you're looking to, to um, you know, to reach those goals um, and looking and see what you're looking to achieve going forward. Uh, yeah. yeah, exactly right. You know, what are you trying to achieve? You know, do you want to grow by how much and when? So, you know, setting those clear measurable goals, um, you know, Focusing on on your on your strengths and you know, areas that you can grow, um, uh, where you can deliver best value. So you know it's about uh, which segments can be easiest to grow right now. Um, you know where are you experiencing growth, um, and, and and you know continuing to, to to farm that area if you like. Um, 
uh, again, you know, no, nothing new there. It's all about getting the strategy right. Uh, so understand the business situation, the audiences, and, and, and your strategy. In, in terms of marketing techniques, well, yeah, and I mentioned before about you know many of the, the traditional marketing techniques have online counterparts these days, and it's really about you know using a mixture of both uh, based on what works for you. Isn't it? You know, but don't spread yourself too thin. I, I would be the message there. I mean, if your audience is if your audience uh, or your target audience doesn't use Twitter, well, there's no there's no need to be on Twitter. Um, don't spread yourself too thin. I always say, you know, go deeper with a few. Be, you know, focus on one. Uh, become the master of that before moving on to another channel, if you like. Particularly when you're talking about social media, um, you know, know where your audience is and, and try and be there, um, and be prepared to adapt. So, you know, certainly, you know. 12 months ago, webinars like this, um, uh, you know, were few and far between, I guess, and now they, they're, they're, they're par for the course. So just on that that point, you mentioned that point, um, go deeper with fewer, and, and often people will try a scattergun approach mm. and, and try a bit of everything. Um, is your, your sort of advice or experience there that that may not be the best approach? Look, I think you know, for most small businesses that I, that I come into contact with, they're time poor, and and you know, one of the biggest uh, uh, problems uh, we have is is developing content. You know, uh, most small business owners are the experts in their field, uh, and you know, they know better than most, uh, you know, what problems their clients are experiencing and, and and the best way to solve that. But to get that. To get to get that knowledge out of them is very difficult sometimes when you know, when they are so time poor. So, you know, trying to be all things to all people just doesn't work. So it's really about having a um, having a having a, an approach where it's uh, fewer, bigger, better, I suppose, and just making sure that um, what, what you are doing, you're doing well, and and it works for you. So, what what advice do you have, I guess, for for clients trying to navigate this new mm. new environment that we're operating in yeah look I, i've been telling our clients really it's about you know preparing for the marathon marathon not the sprint you know it's you know take the time to collect the data um get gather those customer insights and, and work on your strategy you know really look at um uh, you know, really look at you know where you're positioned in the market what your strengths and weaknesses are and, and develop those um you know spend less time and effort uh, on on chasing you when you've you know when you've got a, a captured audience already, um, you know how are they feeling? What are they doing? You know, sell sell more to existing, sell new to existing. Uh, you know, you've got it. You've got clients there um, that that's worked for you in the past. Don't don't ignore them. Um, work with them as a starting point at the very least. Um, and, and invest in improving uh, the customer experience. We, we've seen that. Try to provide value and 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 look at you know, where, where their pain points are and what are the barriers for them to, um, you know, to, to move forward uh, yeah, with the product or service that you offer. Uh, and, and I think, you know, that age old question about traditional versus digital is sort of out the window now. It's really about understanding where your audience is and be there. So um, if your audience is online, be online. Um, you know, if, you, if you have an audience that... Um, that tends to favour a traditional approach, then you need to at least spend some energy trying to reach those as well. Yeah. Um, so I guess uh, this um, it's worthwhile spending a little bit of time on on the flywheel. Yeah, this is really uh, you know sort of speaks to the, um, the you know uh, nurturing uh, approach rather than the, rather than selling. So it's about you know, we're all familiar with the, um, you know, the buyer journey, I, I guess, and I'll try to summarise into three phases. There's the attract phase, the engage phase, and the delight phase. So, you know, uh, in the attract phase, you know, visitors are really trying to work out, um, uh, you know, what their problem is. Um, you know, they don't really know uh, what their problem is. Um, they're, they're starting that research phase, looking to find um, uh, content that helps with their problem. Uh, then they move through to the, the engage phase, which is where 
you know, they, they, they know what the problem is and now they're looking to solve it. So people's search habits have changed over time now. And, you know, they're asking uh, deeper questions about, you know, how do I fix this? You know, where do I get that? And, and if you can provide good uh, content to solve their problems, then you're starting to, um, you know, move them along the, uh, the trust uh, continuum, I, I guess. So, and, and, and so, you know, it's, it's really the old sort of jab, jab, hook approach. You know, you're really, um, you know, nurturing that lead uh, before you make the sale. And then once you've got the sale, which is, you know, uh, it's about delighting those customers and, and helping them to, um, uh, uh, helping them to remember that why they chose you as their, as their provider or, or of that product or service, um, you know, and, and that's when they become a promoter and uh, will then refer you to a friend or, or, or others. So it's really about um, a, a continuum of, of, of nurturing so that you've got a customer for life and that lifetime value. Yeah, I guess that probably one of the points there that resonates with me is that they, the, the sales process part and more particularly the help instead of sell. And I think mm -hmm. that's, you know, goes a really long way to, to engaging that, that customer, uh, whichever industry or market you're in. Yeah. So we've got a whole lot of good ideas here. We, we know what COVID's doing. We know what people are thinking. We've developed a strategy. We know what we have to do, but often the, the hardest step to take is the first one. Um, so, you know, where do we start with all of this? Look, the, it, I think, you know, it's getting back to basics and making sure you understand the, you know, the, the, the strategy. I always like to focus on the three C's, you know, the, um, you know, company strengths and weaknesses. Um, you know, what do my customers think and, uh, and what, you know, where am I positioned in relation to my competitors? So, you know, that, that it's, it's really getting back to strategy. But in terms of uh, some, some quick wins, I think, you know, it's about, you know, staying connected with your customers, building relationships, um, and, and certainly virtually these days, uh, improving your online presence, um, looking at emailing your customers, um, starting a blog if you, if you, if you, um, uh, if you haven't done that in the past, you know, uh, certainly a good way to start that uh, informative educational process and building trust, um, revitalize your website, uh, your Facebook presence. If you haven't been on there for a while, it's, it's about, you know, that that's all about credibility and trust. Um, uh, Google my business, same sort of deal. So really making sure that all those uh, online platforms that you're on are up to date uh, focus on re getting more reviews from customers that have used your service. Uh, they're the sorts of things that, um, uh, you know, are quick wins for people, I guess. Uh, yeah, easy enough to sort of start with. And I guess, Gary, one of the things that, that we're um, talking to clients um, regularly about is the, the measure, monitor, manage mantra. Um, and that's equally applicable to the marketing strategy. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, going to the point that Mick's previously raised, you know, having a marketing plan, you know, encompassing all those things in regard to different strategies. And I suppose that would be a really useful place to start is uh, Mick, as Mick pointed out earlier, that one of the challenging things with most small businesses in regard to marketing is that, um, you know, making the next sale, delivering the next product, serving the next customers often, take, often takes priority to the long-term sort of marketing and business development processes. And I think um, in that respect, it's, that's where a marketing plan is quite useful in just putting um, some framework around the amount of time that you may need to put to, to developing um, and implementing certain marketing strategies. Um, so you develop you know, a clear online strategy, not only around uh, what your time available you've got, but also working around a marketing um, financial budget um, where you make an assessment about what percentage of your um, income, for instance, you're going to spend on marketing. And, and a lot of the businesses that we're seeing have put, you know, effective marketing strategies in place, probably spending about 5% of their turnover on marketing, which sounds like a lot, but uh, they are getting really effective results and, you know, quite significant um, impacts on the bottom line, particularly in this COVID environment where, um, you know, not only is their marketplace disrupted, but, but all their competitors' markets are disrupted and people are on the move. 
Um, so having a clear marketing plan, particularly post-COVID, is really important because the market's changed. Um, and then having a clear understanding about what you, what dollar amount you're going to allocate to marketing is actually quite critical. So, you know, in, in a lot of ways, we, when we do our marketing budget, often uh, we might look at a financial year. Um, I think this year is probably a good a classic example where you might contemplate doing a mid-year marketing plan and budget for a post-COVID environment. Um, and, you know, it seems like um, having mid-year plans is not out of the question. As you say, we've just had a federal budget that was, you know, some six months after what it would normally have. We've got a state budget that's about to release in the next couple of weeks, which is also about six months later than normal. And a lot of that is actually clever strategy. It's simply reflecting... We're in an unusual environment. Uh, we need to create a new plan to allow for those change circumstances. And we also need to have a financial um, plan that kind of accompanies that. Um, so I think all those things that, Mick's talk, that Mick has talked about, incorporating those into a new strategy, a new plan going forward for the remainder of the next six to 12 months is probably a really effective business strategy. I guess the most difficult thing about formulating a plan for a post-COVID environment is when we, we when will we actually have a post-COVID environment? Mm. Um, yeah. And I think it goes to the fact you've probably got to create a plan, not necessarily around a post-COVID environment, but, but you know, an existing uh, COVID environment. Mm. You know, how do you manage yep. that? Because it's probably going to be too late to wait for a new strategy for a post-COVID environment. We don't even know what that looks like. Um, yeah, and I guess one you know one of those things is we do need to have um, to still keep an eye on what might be happening post COVID and have a, an understanding of what our approach might be. It's just um, then seeing how things playing out and working out at what the appropriate time is to pivot from our our COVID strategy to our post COVID strategy, uh, but importantly have it have it there ready to go um, yep. as, as the time arrives. So. Um, we might leave the final word to Mick. Um, look, there's been lots of information that we've gone through today and, um, you know, we really, really appreciate uh, you spending the time uh, with us and our, and our clients to, to run through the, the marketing side of things from a COVID perspective. But, you know, where do you see things at going forward? Yeah, look, I think uh, the conversation you guys just had then was, you know, really spot on in terms of, you know, obviously we've got to focus on the here and now because that's vital for many businesses that have been in lockdown and just coming out of hibernation as such. But you do have to keep an eye on the future and, and, and what that post-COVID um, time might look like. And we, we are already seeing from the numbers we looked at today that there's steady and sustained um, growth in buyer engagement. So, um, you know, the market uh, is moving there for, for across many categories and industries, um, certainly businesses with an online presence are going to be at a distinct advantage um, in, in, in capitalising on that uh, increased buyer engagement. And so, you know, I encourage businesses, you know, to be ready for that, uh, be ready for that interest, get ready now. That's a huge area of opportunity as, as, what are we ne as we enter the next phase. Mm. All right. Thanks again, Mick, for joining us today. Um, yeah, we really appreciate that. And thanks also to Gary for um, sharing your knowledge as well. Uh, it's always good to get um, a perspective of, of not only, I guess, the theory as to what's happening, but also what's happening on the ground from, from a client perspective. And, and we're in a fortunate position that, that you know, we're, we're talking to clients every day. Um, so we have a reasonable understanding of, of, the, of, I guess, the practical issues that are going on. Um, within clients' businesses. So um, thank you both for your time today. Um, next week, we're going to shift our focus a little bit and we're going to look at the tax and legal ob obligations and some of the impact that COVID-19 is, is having in that space, particularly around small business contracts, um, commercial tenancies, um, which um, was, was quite a big issue um, during the COVID period, you know, how businesses are dealing with, with franchises and, and legal avenues around getting paid and, and debt recovery and the like. So we're going to be joined by Amy Harper, who's a partner at Kells, um, and Angela Hales, who's a director at Accounting Professionals, um, to run through some of those issues um, next Tuesday at nine o'clock. So 
we look forward to seeing everybody again next week and, and thanks for your time today.